Hi, I'm Pastor Joel Pledge, and welcome to the Bible study today. We're beginning a new series on, uh, it's entitled Cornerstones of Truth. It's from a book by Global University. And uh, tonight's lesson is on the nature of God. Okay. Now, we I have not come to debate the existence of God. If you're uh, viewing today and you're not familiar with uh, that argument or the uh, the uh, debate surrounding the existence of God, that's not we're we're not here to do that today. We are here uh, to examine who this God is, as He is revealed to us in Scripture. Um, we we uh, see the interactions that God has with mankind. Uh, and throughout salvation history, and that's what we regard the Old and New Testament uh, as being, is the history of our salvation, the history of how God has interacted with man. And as such, we see uh, the nature of this God, and it is a very consistent picture that we see of him in both the Old and the New Testaments. We are accepting by faith that God exists, and we move to the second question, uh, about God is, who is this God of the Bible? When we read the Old Testament, it's a record of the history of Israel on one level, but we also know that they have a, a history with God. They have a faith that God exists, and, and they describe for us uh, his nature uh, by means of their own history, their own uh, prophets, their priests, their kings, uh, just some of the ordinary people of life give to us or reveal to us the nature of God. Uh, Israel describes God as a personal God. He's a God who speaks. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob all spoke to God. They listened to God. They responded when God uh, moved in their life, when he interjects himself into the um, their family and their walk and their their dreams and their plans, okay? At other times of history, God did not speak directly to uh, individuals, but he spoke to prophets who then spoke to the, to the nation or to kings or to individuals. Sometimes it was a priest. Uh, most of the time we see it as, as the prophets. But the message that comes to those prophets is always personal in nature. It's not uh, coming from a force or an energy or, a, oh, what can I say, uh, some kind of, of uh, uh, um, cloud-filled room. It is a personal relationship that they have with God. And out of that relationship, they have a word, a message for the nation. Um, if anything uh, the Bible does... Um, is that the Bible uh, makes God too personal and too human. Uh, they figuratively describe God with uh, hands and feet and eyes and ears, and uh, he is uh, brought down to our level, okay? He's brought down to our level. Um, we we uh, recognize this as figurative language, that man is trying to describe their experience with God without being able to see God, because God, we know, is invisible. God reveals himself in the Old Testament uh, in, in many different uh, yeah, kind of angelic forms. We, we call them theophanies. These are times in which God appears as a man, um, or, or some kind of, again, some kind of angelic um, image, the angel of the Lord. Um, in the New Testament, he comes, God reveals himself in the person of Jesus. He is the image of God in, uh, in human form. And Jesus came as the son of man. He's one of us. He's our representative. He will die on the cross as the son of man. But he was at the same time, we call it 100% man, 100% God, uh, he is God uh, uh, in human form, in human flesh, revealing uh, who God the Father is, okay? And really promising also um, the, the, uh, the Holy Spirit to us. And again, as, the, as, as we look, um, I, I will say to you that God has given uh, human characteristics um, so much uh, because of uh, sometimes it's poetry and sometimes it's uh, just the, the only way that we can um, communicate. You know, God speaks. 
Um, God works in our lives. Uh, his, his hand is seen. The, the hand of action is there. Um, the other thing that the, uh, especially the Old Testament does is, is that the poet may describe storms or wind as a revelation of God's power or of his majesty or of um, um, that which is indescribable to him. Okay, we often do this, that nature, the powers of nature overwhelms us as an individual and is in, in, this, is in this sense um, similar to the interactions that we have with God. So uh, be aware of that. Okay, uh, God is a spirit as such, doesn't have eyes and ears and, and um, uh, hands and feet. Um, Jesus does, as, as he's become human flesh, but God him, himself um, does speak, he does hear, he does act, he, um, he thinks, he decides, he discerns, um, and, and those things make him personal for us. And, and that is what, God, uh, uh, what we speak of when we say that God is personal. Um, he is uh, a God who who thinks, a God who decides, a God who speaks, a God who responds when uh, we uh, do, both do good and, and do evil, okay? It is a, when we say God is, a per, is personal, we're saying that he enters into that one-to-one -one relationship with, uh, with human beings, okay? He enters into that one-to-one -one human relationship. Uh, in the Old Testament, uh, we see it much clearer. Abraham is going to be visited by three men, and he will call one of them, at least, maybe all three, but he will say, the Lord, lo the Lord, you've come to visit me, and he'll have a long conversation, and they'll have a meal together. And, and so there is a very personal relationship there. We see it in Moses. who has a very personal relationship with God. It is said that God uh, spoke to Moses as a, as a man speaks to his friend, okay? So there is a, a very intimate, uh, close relationship that Moses has with God. Elijah seems to be a little more removed from that, but yet God speaks to him and he responds to that and, and will spend some time arguing with God and just say at one point, God, uh, you know, I don't want to live. Please kill me now. Please take me now. Um, and, and God will speak to him in a still, small voice about his life and his future and um, a very personal moment. Uh, Elijah is struggling with, his, uh, with what has gone on in his life, and God, uh, I can't say encourages him, and this is not something that I, I could use the words encourage, but God is uh, intimately involved uh, in his life as, as, a, as a friend, Okay. So God is revealed in the Bible as personal. He is also revealed by the truth that he has a personal name in the Old Testament. Okay? And that God is revealed to us, again, in, in the New Testament, especially as Father, that Jesus reveals himself as, as a Father. Let me see if I can pull this up. I've already skipped some of these. This is the nature of God, and we've been talking about God being personal. Um, that he thinks, makes decisions, speaks, and responds. And, and this is uh, a little background that I want to bring to you on, uh, on, on, the, on God being a person, okay? Um, the Old Testament is, is originally written in Hebrew. This is the actual, uh, some pages, or, or not pages, but this is part of the scroll of Isaiah that was found in the, in the Dead Sea, along the Dead Sea. Um, in the Old Testament, the Hebrews referred to God by name. Okay? The word God is a generic term, God. Uh, in Hebrew, it's El. My name is Joel. And uh, it, it really um, would translate into uh, Yah is God. Yahweh is God. And, um, um, but for the Hebrews, God's name was personal. And in the Old Testament, they used it. It would go into disuse because they were so afraid of misusing the name of God or taking the name of God in vain that they would no longer 
uh, pronounce the name of God in, in common conversation and perhaps even in religious conversation. But the name Yahweh is found over 6,000 times in the Old Testament. The name Yahweh, again, uh, in, sometimes it's a shortened form of just Yah, and sometimes it's, it's, it's Yahweh. And I believe that this reveals to us the very personal nature of their relationship with God. Okay, now the surrounding cultures, they had Baal as God, Molech was a God, Dagon was a God. All of them had names, okay? Very, uh, so they were, it's not unusual that Israel uh, w would have a name. And I'm talking here, um, uh, th this personal name of God, this is, this is who they knew God to be, Yahweh, the, the name that Moses uh, asks, who, who, who shall I say has sent me? And God says, tell them that the I am has, has sent you. This is Yah, Yahweh, um, who they're to call. And again, 6,000 times it's used, over 6,000 times in the Old Testament. But um, the Hebrew was translated into Greek. And uh, let me bring that up. Next, this is just uh, from one of the uh, minor prophets, uh, one of the, the um, um, uh, just a fragment of the, of the minor prophet, but it's written in Greek. And um, the, uh, the translators made a decision. Uh, this was done in about the third century. And they made a decision as they're translated from the Hebrew to the Greek. Um, they said, wherever the name of the Lord is, the name Yahweh is. 6,000 plus times, we're going to translate that as the Lord, okay, the Lord. So the Septuagint has this. So that reverence for the name of God, okay, has come into the English translations. So if we'll read uh, Deuteronomy 6, and I've got it there in two versions, and then I'll give you a, a literal translation of my own. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Okay, I'm just going to do uh, verse 4, sorry. Uh, that's the, the New Living Translation. The uh, New American Standard Version uh, Bible will say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. Okay? The, the Lord is one. Okay. Now, if you just take it almost word by word, and it's hard to do word by word, but it says this, Here, Israel, Yahweh is our God. Now, boy, if that doesn't say something to me, okay, it, it really does. It's, it shows to me a personal relationship that they had with this God. They knew him by name. Yahweh is our God. We could say, you know, uh, Dagon is the God of the Philistines. Yahweh is our God. Okay, Molech is the god of of um, that culture, and then Baal is the god of the of the Syrians or the Assyrians. Or, uh, but 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 Yahweh is our god. Yahweh is one, or he is he is the only one. Okay, or is God alone? Um, it is a a very personal statement that they're going to make. Now, you'll notice in this that, that um, most Bibles will give to us this, this um, clarification or understanding because Hebrew does have the, a word for Lord, Adonai, if you're familiar with that word. And so they often call God uh, Lord. So in order to distinguish between Adonai and Yahweh, they will capitalize many times in, in most translations, not all, but most, they'll capitalize. I've given it to you there, all capital letters, L-O-R-D, and that's the name of God. And so you can see that. And I, I bring that out to you because um, I want you to see the personal relationship that God had with Israel. He reveals his name to them. They use that name. They... Um, that name is important to them. Yahweh is our God. 
okay? I believe that the action uh, that the, our translators have made uh, into English and, and many other uh, is lessens this personal nature of God um, and, and gives to us what sometimes can become a generic term, just the Lord. Oh, the Lord is good. The Lord is good. It's, it's, it's not quite as personal as saying to us, Yahweh is good. Okay? That immediately draws me into that personal relationship. Okay? Now, I, I want to uh, just emphasize to you that Jesus brings to us a new revelation, um, another aspect of this personal nature of God, in that he reveals um, God as our Father. He is our Father, which art in heaven. He is the Father of Jesus. He is also our Father. You can't, um, this happens to be, <laughs> this happens to be the day of the, the birth of, of our eighth grandchild. A son's been born in here in Tennessee. And as I think about this lesson, I, I just think about that, that relationship uh, between father and son, and how important it is, and how close it is, and how close the relationship that we have as grandparents. It's wonderful. Um, it's wonderful. And, and in such, uh, again, it just emphasizes to us that God is um, personal, okay, by nature. He is personal. The second um, attribute of God that we want to bring to you is this, that God is a spirit. Okay? God is spirit. Jesus is going to emphasize to us that, uh, I, my notes there, or the slide says, the substance and or essence of God. When we talk about God as a spirit, um, you know, we're, we're referring to the fact that God is not material. Okay? He's not uh, matter. He, he, he is uh, uh, matter is that which uh, has weight and takes up space. Okay, that's a scientific definition there, and um, we know that God is not uh, God is not matter. I'm trying to find my notes here just to to bring everything uh, to bring everything I wanted to bring. Okay. Um, I want to make sure that as we say God is spirit, that we are not just simply saying to you, God is the Holy Spirit, okay? It's um, the Holy Spirit is a uh, third person of the Trinity, and we'll talk about that next week, the Trinity. Um, we are not saying God is only the Holy Spirit. We're saying God is a spirit. He is not made of matter. He is uh, not of this material world. He is invisible. He has spiritual substance, okay? Not matter, weight, and and takes up space. He has a spiritual substance, sometimes called an essence, and these are all the qualities or attributes that make up his nature, this substance or essence. He does have that, but he does not have, he is, he is non-corporal, doesn't have uh, this, this human body. Um as such, as God is a spirit, um, again, this is revealed to us by Jesus. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Okay? Very, a very powerful thing, because there's that debate, where should God be worshipped? Okay? In Jerusalem or Samaria, where is God worshipped? And Jesus says to the woman at the well, God is spirit. Okay? God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So as he has this spiritual substance, okay, that means that he is not bound. He, is, he has freedom. He's not bound by this world. He's not bound by any, um, any structures. He's, there's no limits ba uh, placed upon him by this, by this physical world. Now, I'm talking about the entire universe. Okay, which is a very big place. I'm not just talking about this created little blue dot that we live on. But he's not bound by our, by our structures. He's not bound by our laws. He is a spirit. He is, he is out, not outside of, but yes, outside of that, that realm, transcendent we call it. 
but he is also within. He is he is uh, a part of this world. I think those are some terms we'll get into as we move along in this study. Okay? And as such, as, as he is a spirit and he has freedom, then he has the freedom to interact with us on that personal level. He is uh, he is free to, to act. He's not manipulated by us. He's not coerced by us. Uh, we can't manipulate God. We can't coerce him to do what we want him to do. He is free to act according to his nature in every situation. Okay. Now, again, God is spirit. Okay. Not part of this world, not of material nature, um, but he is personal. I, I, I have to emphasize that because um, our, our culture is, um, we, we've been touched by, um, by uh, Star Wars and Star Wars famous line, the force be with you. The force be with you. And, uh, you know, we, oh, we've got the force of the Holy Spirit with us, or God is a spirit, he's with us. And the force is not a personal um, energy source. He's not, there's nothing personal about the force in Star Wars. But God is personal, okay? He has relationships. There, there is great power, energy. There is life. He is the source of all life. He sustains the very universe in which we live. At the same time, he is desirous of relationship with you. He is personal. God, who introduces to us, and, and I gave you that verse, he introduces us to this God as a father. He is our heavenly father. And he is a spirit who we worship in spirit and in truth. So again, the, the God is spirit. He's distinct from this world. He's unique from this world. He is, he is a substantial being. Okay, It's not just smoke and mirrors. It's, it's not just a, a vapor that appears and is gone. Um, so we speak of the substance of God. There is something there. Okay, It's not impersonal. He is personal God. There's an essence of God that we're talking about. All of these qualities that make up his nature. Okay, this this thinking, acting, speaking, this the love, the holiness, the righteousness that is God. Um, all these things that we know of Him. Okay, I love the verse. Uh, I, I think I have it in, in, in Timothy that Paul uses uh, in chapter six. At just the right time, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and only almighty God. What a powerful statement there. Okay? He, he, he's going to refer to, to God as the blessed and only almighty God. And we'll call him the King of kings and the Lord of all lords. He alone can never die. He lives in light so brilliant that no human can approach him. No eye has ever seen him, nor ever will. All honor and power to him forever. Amen. And this is a powerful description, and I, and I like it. Um, I refer to it in, in, uh, because it uses that phrase, King of kings and Lord of lords, which in Revelation is referred to, given to Jesus. That's the title that's revealed as, as Jesus returns to this earth uh, to rule and to reign that he's king of kings and lord of lords. And Paul gives that um, description to God himself, okay? Which is, which is um, uh, I think, significant to us. There is no separation between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We'll, we'll talk about that next week. And when we get to talking about the Trinity and, and the three persons of the Trinity, uh, which is a great mystery for us. So I do want to clarify something here, and it's hard to understand. Um, it's, 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 even in the theological reading, um, here doesn't uh, refer to it. Our book doesn't refer to this, and uh, no, no other, um, I haven't come across it in any other theology book as well. Okay? Because, um, Prior to the birth of Christ at Bethlehem, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I would describe them that way. He's personal. He's a spirit. He is spirit. 
Jesus, I believe, is that which appeared in the Old Testament, whether we call him the angel of the Lord or whether or not we just see him as the Lord, uh, a theophany, which is a manifestation of God. That's what the word means. Um, when he became flesh, when he became a human being, born in Bethlehem, I believe the nature of God has a slight shift, okay? A slight shift. It is for our benefit and for our blessing. And um, I think it, it points us to the great sacrifice that Jesus himself made when he laid down his glory, but he also laid down this nature of being spirit. Jesus now has material existence. Okay. He has a material existence. He became human. He lived on the earth. He died on the cross. He was resurrected. But he didn't, he wasn't resurrected just spiritually. He wasn't a ghost. He says, I'm not a ghost. A ghost can't, you can't touch a ghost. A ghost can't eat. He says, touch me. But put your hand in my side, said to Thomas. You know, hey, I, I'm, I'm real. I have a material body. I, I have a, a corporal body. Um, and that's important, I believe, because as we talk about God, the very nature of God as, as being personal and spirit, that, that when we get to heaven, as Paul says, no man's ever seen God. Well, even when... John the Revelator is talking about heaven and he sees the throne. He doesn't see a person sitting on that throne. Okay? He knows it's God, but there seems to be no uh, material um, image that is there. Nothing that he can see and, and give form to. Okay? Oh, he looks like me. Or he doesn't look like me at all. He, he is spirit. We're not going to see God. And I would clarify God the Father. But we will see Jesus. This is This is who who, who uh, John saw uh, in the great image of Christ in John chapter 1, or Revelation chapter 1, this one who, who's, who's, who was filled with the glory of God, um, very uh, figurative, you know, a sword comes out of his mouth, his hair is white, he's, he's, uh, uh, he's of a majestic nature, okay? But he is a God that can be seen and that can be touched. And so I just want to make that clarification as we're talking about God. What a great sacrifice that he made for us because he will be in that form of the resurrected Christ for eternity. But there is a distinct change that happens. Okay? Now, we also, when we look at the nature of God, we would say that God is one. Okay? Okay? Now, when we say that God is one, we're talking about three different concepts. We're, we're talking about the numerical unity of God, the uniqueness of God, and the simplicity of God. Okay? Um, all right. Well, let me, let me hold this. Uh, well, we can read that verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 6. But for us, and in this verse, Paul is comparing for us um, the idolaters of his day, they go and they sacrifice uh, meat, uh, a, a, an animal to to the um, to the god at the temple, and then they they serve that meat or have have dinner with that uh, sacrifice. And Paul's talking and and saying, we know that these are not gods at all, okay? Because he says, for us, but for us, okay. They serve Zeus, they serve Aphrodite, they serve Artemis, they serve all these different gods, Caesar. But for us, there is one God, the Father, by whom all things were created, and for whom we live. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things were created, and through whom we live. Okay? There's that emphasis on equality between God the Father and God the Son. Okay? Now I want to I want to uh, just mention something. We'll, we're going to pick it up next week in terms of the um, uh, of the Trinity. 
But when we talk about God being one, we're not teaching that God is is one being who has revealed himself in three ways or three modes. Okay? Um, he's not one and has just simply revealed himself as the Father and then then he no longer is the Father, now he's the Son, or now he's not the Son, now he's the Holy Spirit. These are, um, um, there's an ancient um, heresy uh, that began in the second century, third century. Uh, it's called uh, modalism. It teaches that God existed in time in three distinct modes of being. First, the Father in heaven. Secondly, the bodily as the Son on the earth, and now as the Holy Spirit. But we teach a triune God. We're going to talk about the Trinity next next week. Uh, but this, which this says, the Trinity says there is one God who exists in three persons. We're going to discuss that. And, and again, um, it is important for you to recognize we're not we're not preaching a oneness doctrine. Okay. So throughout the Bible, God is revealed to us as one God. I read that verse to you there in 1 Corinthians 8. Um, this is a radical concept, especially in the history of Israel. Okay, a radical concept in the history of Israel. Because in their day, their surrounding cultures would have more than one God. More than one God. More than one God. They're sacrificing to a... Uh, uh, a number of different gods, um, and God um, reveals himself to Israel. He is one God. There is to be no other gods. You don't worship any other god. He is not one of many. He is the one true God. And uh, in the Roman world, they were adding gods because they were adding Caesars as gods, uh, building temples to Caesars, sacrificing to Caesars, um, there were many gods, any number of gods that could be worshipped for any number of reasons. And so it's a radical concept when you limit yourself to the one true God, okay? The one true God. Sometimes we as Christians uh, are accused of worshipping three gods, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But for whatever, not for whatever reason, but the New Testament never has a problem with it. They still assert there is one God, Jesus is one Lord, and there's no contradiction or no change in the nature of God. Jesus, God is the one true God, Jesus is the one true Lord, and he's described exactly the same way, or Jesus is described exactly the same way as the Father, as we read in there in 1 Corinthians 8, um, created all things and by all and through whom we live. It's both the Father and the Son. Uh, throughout Scripture, the, God created the heavens and the earth. The Holy Spirit created them. Jesus created them. Um, it's, there, there's always interchangeable. Okay, So we do know that Judaism still today is radically monotheistic. One God and one God only. Islam is the same way. Allah is God. Muhammad is their prophet. And that's it. We believe the same. There is one God. He has revealed himself or not, he is in us as three persons in one Godhead, a triune God. Okay? Um, but let me, let me emphasize to you, um, uh, again, we, we, read, um, we read Deuteronomy um, 6 and 4, but uh, Deuteronomy 4, I don't know what verses I have. I, I've got a number. I've got some verses in here that I could give to you right quick. I, I actually went to Isaiah because Isaiah gives to us, there is no other God, Isaiah 43. There never has been and never will be. I, yes, I am the Lord and there is no other Savior. Oh, praise God. Okay. See, let's listen. And I, I'll stay in Isaiah 44, 6. I am the first and the last. There is no other God. 45 and 6, I am the Lord, there is no other. Okay, uh, so when we, when we make this affirmation that there is but one God, okay, um, okay, when we say in, in Deuteronomy 6 and 4 that um, Yahweh is our God, he is 
the one true God, okay, then Israel is excluding all other gods. The Old Testament also talks about the uniqueness of God, and those verses that I read to you really give to you that idea that there's only one God, okay? All of these other things are false gods. Um, when they talk of idols, you know, these are, this is, uh, somebody carved this in wood and overlaid it in gold, and it looks good, it's wonderful, but it has no power, does not speak, does not act. And uh, so God is unique, okay? God is very unique. Um, <clears throat> there is, in this uniqueness of God, some accommodation, okay? Because um, God said to, to Israel in the Ten Commandments, he says, I'm the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. In other words, there's, there's some ideas... My wife just called me. It's wonderful just as I'm getting here to the end. And I'm going to close here in a minute. Um, this gives the possibility, or that verse gives the possibility that Israel may and they will uh, have, uh, uh, they will serve other gods. Um, but um, Throughout the rest of Scripture, God is unique. He, he will claim that there's only one God in the universe. The final um, uh, aspect of God or concept of this oneness of God is that there is simplicity, okay? Uh, o Israel, the Lord our God uh, is our God, the Lord alone. He is one God, okay? Zechariah 14, 9, the Lord will be king over the earth, and on that day there will be one Lord. His name alone will be worshipped. Okay. Um, so as we as we as we understand simplicity, brings us to this idea. Okay. And again, let me let me get to my final notes here. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, referring to an, uh, when we when we talk about this unity of God or this inner unity of God, we we call it the simplicity of God. And when what we mean by that is, is that God is free from any division into parts. God is one. And there is, there is no division in God at all. God is spirit. He cannot be divided. You and I are divided. We say of ourselves, I'm a spirit who has a soul who lives in a body. And um, if you take away this body, I still exist. I'm in the presence of the Lord. God is spirit. He is spirit only. He is not spirit and body and, and, and mind and heart and all of these things. We are told to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, thy soul, thy, all that I, they might. Um, it's, it's, uh, God is, um, it's, um, we talk of the simplicity of God in that regard. When we come to this nature of God, we, we see that God is perfect. He is self-existent, simple. Okay, that's what we talk about, the simplicity. He doesn't need anything uh, to exist. He's not dependent upon anything outside of himself for existence. As perfect, he is not described as righteous or holy, but in his very essence is righteousness and holiness. As we, as we close tonight, um, I just remind you, we're going to study or begin with the uh, God is triune. The Trinity of God next study. But I also want to remind you that God wants a personal relationship with you. He's a very personal God. He's revealed himself as a loving Heavenly Father that cares for you and your every need. You may not have had a loving Heavenly Father in this earth, but you have one in heaven. He loves you. He has made a way for you to have that relationship, to be have a, a, an intimate and personal relationship with him. God bless you as you as you serve him and as you uh, read and study your word. Uh, may his grace and mercy abound in your life. Amen and amen.